think that should do it. Um, okay, so tonight we've got Mika Karina de Sousa, and uh, she, AKA the Fig Queen. Um, she's got quite a following online on her Facebook account and YouTube. Uh, she runs Fig AgriLab Asia, and we're some of the earliest adopters of growing figs in Singapore and Malaysia, which are uh, more tropical climates than we have here in our Mediterranean zone. Figs aren't as common to grow there, uh, which she'll talk about. So uh, they've been working through lots of challenges with that, falling in love with figs, and they're sharing that back with the world. Uh, they have quite a vast collection of figs. Um, they're very dedicated collectors and go to great lengths to get unique genetics and preserve genetics. Um, so very much in line with the CRFG and the work that we do. And uh, I wanna give gratitude to Khaled for bringing uh, Mika to my attention and uh, I've enjoyed her videos and learning from her all, all sorts of fig knowledge. And uh, so yeah, um, she will be uh, giving a presentation and then we'll have time for Q&A. And uh, one last note on Zoom is that we are recording this. Uh, so it will be available for future viewing on our YouTube channel, Orange County Fruit, uh, uh, the YouTube channel, Orange County Fruit. Um, actually it's Orange County CRFG, uh, that channel. So anyways, so now we have Mika and uh, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Singapore. Pleasure, Ty. Okay, I need you to help me share the screen. Have you enabled that? I have enabled you as a co-host. So Perfecto. You should be able to do that. Let me share my screen, yeah? All right. And so I think we've allowed enough time for chat to, for the polls uh, or the, the voting to go on. So I'm going to go ahead and shut down the chat briefly. Um, so we have minimal disturbance there. And okay. I'm going to also turn off um, a couple other safety elements. So take it away, Mika. Thanks for joining us. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Ty. And it's, ple it's a pleasure, honestly. And I spoke to John earlier on as well. So I just, um, firstly, I just have to really thank uh, the group, um, the Orange County CRFG, because uh, it, it's a golden opportunity for me, to, especially, you know, coming from Singapore, which is, you know, pretty much a non-gardening kind of an environment. Um, I just want to share a little bit more about how we start the whole thing. And I believe there are pockets of information where you can actually uh, find very beneficial. I do understand it is your fixed season right now. So what better way to kind of kick it off and, and, and show you a little bit more what we do over here and how you can start or even, you know, uh, advance further in your interest in fix. So the other thing that I want to, secondly, I want to just uh, thank Khalid for introducing us uh, to Thai. So I, I think it, it's, a, it's a cool opportunity, uh, honestly, hand on heart. So thank you very much, everybody. So that's me, uh, the vein pot that I am. So I just want to play one video, which I've actually made last year when um, I did a, I was a speaker in one of the launch for one of the gardening, um, you know, one of the gardens in Singapore. Did allow me to just play this quick video because uh, I know I have like 60, 90 minutes anyway. So Enjoy the video, disregard the 2019 date. Is there audio that goes along with the video? Yes, it does. Okay. It's not coming through on this end. But... Oh, man. Just watch the video. I'll talk through it later on. All right. That's quite Apologies professional. 
<laughs> and you, you know what? The, the, the funny part is the kids did it for me. So, um, oh. yeah, thanks to the kids. They are, they are geeks like their dad anyway. So anyway. All um, right, there, there's so I, many things. I do have one mention real quick. Uh, sure. Someone who's also organized Zoom meetings has said that there is a checkbox that must be checked yeah. in order to share audio when you share screen. Um, oh, so man. I think you might have one more video later. Is that correct? Yeah, but that I, I think it's a, a feature of uh, the really, really bad weather. So that, that's no, that you don't require the sound for that. That's fine. Okay. So okay. I can always share the video later on with you as well, Ty. To sure. yeah. share no the problem. All right. So we pretty much have uh, come up with a comprehensive agenda. Although, you know, if you were to ask me to talk about fix, there's no ending to it. Um, we kind of pick out the critical ones. Um, we kind of left out, um, you know, topics like uh, propagation, uh, fertilize, you know, how to feed nutrients in a sense. So I, I did incorporate that a little bit in our slides as well. So there's just, there's no ending to the whole topic, yeah. Uh, but I guess that the critical ones that I want to cover today is pretty much about, um, you know, how we began, the, the climate, the soil, you know, uh, the cultivars that I have, and I can actually kind of recommend that and why we actually chose those cultivars as our favorites. And amongst other things, you know, as a summary, essentially, you know, identifying, if you do want to go into figging, um, identify where, what your object, objectives are, what kind of figure you want to be, and then what's next. So I, I hope um, it's uh, going to be beneficial for everybody. Um, we'll leave the Q&A towards the end for my, uh, for my doctor fig to answer, but um, I hope, um, you know, do, do excuse me for my singlish. I'm controlling very hard not to say all my last and the laws that, uh, you know, the, the unique words in Singapore, but yeah. I'll try to speak slowly and uh, I hope you can, you know, pretty much um, enjoy the, the presentation today. If you can see the picture here on the right, that's actually me in a fig farm in Malaysia. Um, it's interesting because, you know, the one thing that I, and I talked Thai yesterday, the one thing I really crave is to see a huge, big fig tree. Um, we don't have that here, especially with the ficus carica or the common figs. We do have our, um, you know, original fig, native fig trees, uh, the pretty much wild fig trees uh, in our nature reserve. So I do my runs, uh, in our Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. Um, we've got this little hill, it's not even a mountain. There sits a lot of our uh, native fig trees. I think that there are about 48 fig, wild fig trees there. Uh, they're huge, yeah? The leaves are as big as, as, big as my bass drum, honestly. But the thing is, um, you know, I crave, for, I crave to see really huge, big fig trees. And that's something that uh, the other regions are enjoying. So this is a um, somewhat, you know, to compensate that, so we, we do have our version of uh, fig trees, as you can see in the background. I'll cover that in a little while as well. So I'm going to go through the first uh, slide here. If you can see, that's Dr. Fig. And he is the reason for my uh, huge investment in figs. So he's my wonderful uh, fifth kid. No, he's my husband. Um, he's uh, very much uh, into gardening. Um, uh, by profession, I am a sales and marketing person in the corporate world for since day one of my working life. I've not gone into, uh, you know, I've not done gardening at all. I'm one of those uh, few people who tiptoe and don't even hold, uh, don't even hold on to soil. I get really icky about it. But the thing is, um, as I as I age, uh, I'm close to 50 right now. As I age, I notice that the corporate world is uh, really hard, and uh, I I yearn to kind of you know chill out a bit, stress out, and and the, and he kind of introduced me to gardening. So we started off with uh, a lot of um, you know. Uh, we, we grew a lot of uh, fruit trees and very, very rare fruit trees as well. So it's interesting enough that I got invited in this. I'm really excited about it. So we really started uh, doing gardening. And the thing about Singapore, if you do know, if you try to find us on the map, it's just one tiny little dot. Uh, land is really scarce over here. Uh, not many of us are exposed to gardening because we are living in urban high-rise um, forest, so to speak. Uh, and we don't get to, to do that at all. So what happened was uh, we took we, we, we took the, you know, we bit the bullet and decided to actually invest in a small little house or property in across the causeway in our neighboring country called Malaysia. So we actually bought a house in Johor Bahru where we have a, a little 
plot of land next to our house, uh, what better way to start gardening in that sense? So there starts the whole passion about, you know, growing um, really cool, nice uh, fruit trees. So we have uh, variegated bananas, we have sapote, we have jackfruit, all sorts of jackfruits. Uh, I've collected more than uh, 20 passiflorus, uh, almost done with my collection with finger limes um, and a lot of other interesting stuff. I have cashew trees, uh, pistachios and everything. So that, that kind of started the whole, um, you know, interest in gardening. Um, then we actually, uh, we had a, a short holiday in, uh, in the US, in Houston, to visit my sister-in-law a couple of years back. And uh, we went to the gardening centers and uh, my husband found a fake plant or a tree. And there was no ending to that, trust me. So we bought it for my sister-in-law. We painstakingly, you know, put it in the ground for her because she's, she's, a, uh, she's exactly like me. She, she does no gardening at all. Um, happy to note and, and, and update everyone that plant that we planted has grown like into a huge tree. So I'm really excited to kind of meet her next year to at least see that tree that we planted. So yes, that's the Dr. Fig. Um, we kind of invested a lot of... Um, you know, we, we brought that, that passion back and the interest in growing figs because we found later on that um, there were no figures in Singapore. Uh, no one knew what figs were. When I mentioned figs, they thought I was talking about pigs. Uh, it was really funny. So it, they've not tasted the figus carica, the common figs. All they know is the, possibly the wild figs. And they usually use that for herbs where they boil, you know, when they, they boil for um ailments like cough and so forth. So I kind of told uh, Dr. Fick, um, I think it's critical that uh, we start off something, you know, to, to create a little bit of interest and, and, and education uh, to the general public in Singapore and Malaysia about figs. Um, it, was a, it was a huge, um, it was an experience, I, I guess. It's a very long journey, but it was so enjoyable. Um, so that's a little bit about us, uh, the couple, the crazy couple who are addicted to figs. Um, and uh, we pretty much have, you know, brought the culture back here. We kind of move all our fruit trees outside the compound, uh, our house compound, and translated the whole fig, uh, the, the whole garden to fig garden. So uh, currently, we have close to about one thousand two hundred plants in the house vicinity, uh, with about seven hundred cultivars that we have collected uh, from all over the world uh, over the years. So the couple um, are blessed with four wonderful fig kids. Uh, they are not Jolly Rouge, Jolly Noah, Jolly Amber, and Jolly Three, but more of uh, Sarah, Savio, Sophia, and Savian. Uh, very interesting children because I think um, they are, I mean, all parents will say that, you know, the children are really nice and, and perfect and everything. But I think the one thing that I want to inculcate uh, in them is to, you know, kind of develop that DNA in them to love gardening. Um, it, it's a privilege, honestly, for the children because we homeschool the children. Uh, what better way to kind of educate them beyond the box or, out, you know, get them to think outside the box. Uh, the names there are actually the, the cultivars, the fake cultivars that have been assigned to them to ensure the longevity of the cultivar. As most of you have known uh, or already know that some of the fakes are really almost extinct. Uh, we do have conservatories around the world, uh, just maintaining some of the cultivars and we have been in touch with some of the um, fake owners, fake master fake collectors man managing those conservatories. So I think some of the names that might pop up uh, in mind would be Montserrat, Paolo Bologna and, and so forth. So my four uh, wonderful fake kids do uh, assist us in our gardening. Um, they are masters, let me tell you, in propagating. They, they do, I've I've hands off practically uh, very much on rooting the cuttings, you know, um, doing air layering or mar they call it marcotting, uh, as well as repotting and so forth. They are really cool kids. So um, we have a lot of videos uh, that we have uh, actually done over the years, close to about 200 videos, and they are available in YouTube. Um, please feel free to, to take a look at them as well. All right. So what's next um what better way to spread the love so i have been um involved uh, very actively actively in the gardening forum groups in singapore and malaysia um they have about close to in, in total about two hundred thousand members uh in fig agrolab asia we have maintained uh, about fourteen thousand members uh, i think interestingly enough when i started uh, the fig 
passion and, and gardening, uh, I noticed in the social media platform, there were not many farmers or gardeners who are so in the face. So some people may love me, some people may not. But I think at the end of the day, I kind of uh, injected a lot of fun into gardening uh, to kind of entice people to start gardening. So I, I've been speaking to a lot of the farmers in Malaysia who are really keen to start in fig farming. Uh, I've done a lot of talks in the forums uh, that are, you know, that they have um, annually in terms of meeting. Um, I do, I have been invited to openings uh, by the National Singapore National Development Board as well as Singapore Botanical Gardens in that sense. So this is, is a nutshell, in a nutshell, what we actually do as a family. Um, the recent launch that we've done, uh, this is not a sales talk, guys. It's just about pure research that we have done. Uh, we kind of documented. I think one of the key things we, uh, we discovered very quickly uh, was to document every single fig that grow in our garden. Uh, because there, then there weren't any uh, extensive or comprehensive um, database. Although now there are a few of us uh, uh, in the fig groups are actually maintaining that. But I think it was... Uh, you know, it was a good achievement in a sense, whilst we don't have really detailed description, we are trying to as we go along, we, but we do capture the pictures of all the figs that grew in our region. Um, and the thing is, it's exciting enough because um, some of which are really, really and extremely rare, uh, perhaps only like a handful of like perhaps five people in the world possibly having uh, that cultivar. So really interesting um, research that we've done. We have um, successfully researched close to uh, about 1,000 plus cultivars in a research uh, center in Kuala Lumpur, um, essentially in Janda Bay uh, in Selangor. Um, it's um, run by a friend of ours, Datuk Sai Elias, um, and I think we're privileged enough to kind of, um, you know, be able to do all this research and in, in, in discovering what fix work in this climate, which are the ones that perform very well. We have even coined the, the term super fix because these are the fix that brought the same cultivar back into this region. And some will not perform, let me tell you. Some just refuse to grow. Some don't, you know, perf you know if they're supposed to be long elongated twigs, it becomes so roundish. Some looks like a UFO. And we often face with a lot of challenges and um, rebuts in the social media saying, no, Mika, that's not the real one. But hand on heart, we strive uh, really hard to find authenticated ones. So one advice that I can give right now to um, beginners uh, or who wants to go into fix is to always get your cultivars from reliable authenticated sellers that can actually give you a guarantee that they have gotten it from the real master collectors uh, and so forth yeah so i i won't suggest getting it from um, ebay and so forth know your sellers and get it get the cultivars from them all right so let me see uh, let me just go to the next one all right. So in terms of climate, the one thing that I have to say, figs are not native to Singapore, Malaysia, like I've mentioned before. Um, so it is, we, we face with huge challenges uh, in growing them. Plus, uh, they, then there weren't any key experts for knowledge sharing. So uh, we decided to be key experts in that field and, and decided to share to every, uh, share with everyone out what we know about how to grow figs. So the thing is, um, Due to really hot, humid, tropical climate, and not to mention the rain, so you can see that you can see that out of the 365 days, we actually received 220 days. Uh, it's just like Seattle, I think, uh, and it's really bad rain. So I'm just going to show this quick video. It's without uh, the 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 sound, but I think it's best because the thunder is the th the sound of thunder is really bad. Let me just show this quick video on how bad this looks. Okay, when it comes to um, us getting rain. Yeah, unfortunately the sound is not playing, but yes, we receive very bad rain. And the thunder and lightning are killers, mind you, because we're really close to the equator. People really do get killed with, with all the lightning. Um, we realized very quickly, and unfortunately we lost a lot of our cultivars and trees. Uh, we, we realized that figs do not like wet feet. 
all right? So you drown them, you're really gonna lose um, your cultivars in that sense. So we discovered that, you know, very quickly, then we had no rain shelters or greenhouse. What we did was really the manual way of covering them with some bags whenever it rains. And immediately after the rain, we actually open it up because it, the longer you leave the bags there, there'll be fungus attack and so forth and mold attack. So that's not gonna work for any fig, uh, fig plants of ours because the roots will be attacked and damaged very quickly. So if you do encounter a lot of rain, um, my advice is, you know, either do the manual way of doing things. Uh, you really have to come up with some contingency plan. So one of the things that we've done is uh, to actually build or construct what we call rain shelters. Uh, we decided not to put the site nettings because uh, some of the farms actually put site nettings. And I believe in the US, they do have that plastic uh, covering around it. Uh, we decided against it mainly because it is in a residential area. There's not much wind or you know movement of air, and uh, in the event that if uh, we do cover all four sites, we will be facing a lot of attacks like mealybugs, um, you know, a, a lot of attacks with the moles and fungus, and that really kills the plant. In five days, mind you, we have actually encountered that. In five days, if there are no wind, no aeration, no movement of air, the plants can actually attack, uh, be, get, get attacked with the mole and fungus and they can really die very quickly in five days. So um, just be very mindful of that. Um, we do have industrial fence around the, the compound. Um, so this is a, this is a house uh, or residential garden, yeah, everyone. So we try to kind of make it very conducive for the plants because we have invested quite a bit with uh, the cultivars and so forth. So we want to make sure that the plants are healthy and, and have fine. Uh, so we invested a lot of uh, industrial fans, making sure that the, uh, the wind movement is, is a, you know, made available to them. And especially after the rain, the, the spores, we just have to kind of push it out from, from the whole area so that it doesn't sit on any of our plants uh, and it kind of, kind of mitigate that, that uh, attack for fungus and moles. All right, some of, the, um, some of the fig farmers here have actually constructed rain shelter with really good quality highlight diffusion films uh, using photochrome uh, plastics. And these are the ones, I think they kind of imported in Israel. It's really cool because uh, the, the plastic changes color if it's really, uh, if they're exposed to really extreme heat or light. Um, I don't know whether you have it in the States, but it's something that you might want to research on if, um, you know, you're getting really extreme sun. Um, the one thing that I've discovered or the family has discovered that um, with some cultivars, like the black cultivars, they love the sun. Um, they actually change into really pitch dark. So sometimes a little bit of sun is actually good for them. So um, often than not, when some of the figures say, I want to do a rain shelter maker, but I want to cover it with really dark green uh, UV sheets and something, I normally tell them, try not to do allow some light to go through because if you have uh, really black pitch cultivars, it might actually do wonders for your figs. All right? Right, the next cool topic, soil. Uh, for those who have actually been to Singapore, Malaysia, most uh, you will know that our soil is very clay. All right, so this is a picture of me up on a mountain in Selangor uh, because we actually, we actually manually dug out the soil from Bentong. It's a place called Bentong and transport it back to where we live, which is about 330 kilometers. Um, the reason being, we want to make sure that the soil is uh, optimum to the growth of our plants and that the plants, that the clay, the soil that we get from the stores or the gardening centers are often and not very clay. So we don't want to make sure that the, there's a fair mix of soil or good media for our plants. This soil um, in Bentong, if some of you might know um, Bentong Ginger. It's B-E-N-T-O-N-G. B uh, Bentong Ginger is a place. Um, they are very known to grow um, really good. They're really spicy ginger. And amongst uh, they was they claim that it is amongst the spiciest and the most aromatic ginger in the world. So it's called Bentong Ginger, uh, mainly because um, it is from there. And the soil element, the minerals in the soil, is so wonderful that it kind of. Uh, you know, get absorbed into the ginger, for example. So we want to, we know for sure that the soil really works. Um, so we want to make sure uh, we want to research and test out and use it on our figs, all right? So we actually bring it all the way back, uh, believe me or not, on the one. So the one thing that um, I wanted to share as well is due to space constraint, uh, we do, we are 
advocates and an ardent fan of uh, potting culture. Uh, mainly because we have no choice, yeah. So we do a lot of um, our plants. We do grow our plants a lot in the poly bags, um, and um, you notice there it's white in color because uh, the black ones work. But I think the white uh, kind of you know eliminates some heat uh, that goes through in it uh, somehow. So if you do grow your figs in the ground. Firstly, I say congratulations, you're very lucky. Uh, just be very uh, mindful that uh, the figs need really ample space to grow, just like any trees. Um, the recommendation that we, we do give our figures is that uh, if you want to put them into the ground, make sure you set them apart about 1.5 meters apart so that at least it grows. It's really strange, the trees, uh, because when you put them so close together, they naturally grow, uh, you know, if they are really squeezed together and there's no space, they just grow upwards and they don't spread their branches out. It's really strange, but it's just the, the wonderful ways of na uh, nature. So do allow them, uh, do give them a lot of space to grow um, and they, they will really grow wonderfully. Um, it's a very nice picture there. I, I love this picture mainly because uh, it kind of uh, illustrates it is actually possible to grow your trees in a bag, right? Um, some of the trees, when uh, they really shoot close to reaching the roof, um, that's when we actually find out later on the roots actually kind of penetrated out of the back into the land uh, or the, the soil, which is really funny. So that's when you know that you, you need to kind of uh, do a, a little bit of trimming and so forth. All right, um, so clay is very, uh, the, the soil is very clay. Uh, the biggest challenge we, uh, that we encounter or face is the drainage. So remember, they don't like wet feet we want to make sure that the media you know allows well uh, you know well draining in that sense um and in the event that if your soil is very clay um if you were to feed it with a lot of nutrients it's just going to go to waste yeah um so because it's just going to overflow out from the bag so we want to make sure it goes all the way down to the to the ground or to the the bottom of the uh, the bag or the pots so we realized that um you know we need to periodically examine the pots uh making sure that we need you know if amendments need to be made we have to do it quite quickly as well uh to make sure that it's all uh it's loose and and well draining in that sense yeah so always choose your media um properly and um, i'm going to show you how we actually do a soil amendment over here so one of the ratio uh one of the things that we have done is we kind of put in as part of ratio uh sterile rice hull or has uh the reason why i say sterile is because we actually exper experiment or rice has and mind me uh, mind you Asians, being Asians, we eat a lot of rice, yeah. So that's a really readily available. So thanks to that. So we started using rice hull right from the beginning. Um, then we discovered that, you know, we didn't sterile the, uh, sterilize them. So they, we encountered a lot of pathogen attacks uh, attacking the roots. So be very mindful. Uh, always ensure that the rice hull or, or has, they're all sterile. There are really cool ways of uh, doing that. You know, we've done the boiling of the hot water and then pouring into the bucket of rice hull and, and kind of sun it, put it out for sun. And some of them actually kind of wash it first, put into the filter, the water out and put it into the microwave for a good one or two minutes. Some of them forget forget to wash them, put it into the microwave and they got the microwave on fire. So please be, be mindful of that as well. Um, the other component that we put as part of our soil mix would be biochar. And that's actually the burnt rice hull or has. Um, it is one of the most wonderful gifts on earth for gardening for us. Uh, not only it does uh, the mulching function effect, uh, it reduces the, the need for uh, watering. And uh, the good thing about this is we, dis we discover quite quickly when we do that mulching, um, it allows somehow new roots to grow on top above the media. Uh, and you know for sure, you know, in the event, um, if the roots are attacked at the bottom of the pot, um, the roots above kind of allows you to quickly do a backup and cut it and repot it. Um, I can share a little bit more on this if you have any questions uh, later on as well. So the biochar uh, also adds carbon silica to the whole media and uh, it reduces the solid acidity. Okay, another method that we've done uh, as part of amendment program is uh, to include um, to include in the media the 
pathogen-free chicken manure. Uh, again, once again, they have to be pathogen-free, i.e. what it means is essentially you might need to get um, some suppliers over there or your gardening centers, ask them about them, uh, whether they are processed or pathogen-free. The reason is it is, it is, um, it is what it is, it's poop. So you have gotta make sure that there's no bacteria or pathogen because the, in the event, if they do uh, contain a lot of pathogens, the first thing that they're gonna attack will be your roots. And that will result in a lot of, uh, you know, heart pain, honestly, because your plants will eventually die. Um, so pathogen-free ch chicken manure uh, has been really effective for us for root growth. Uh, it also controls uh, RKN, that's the root not nematodes. Um, it's a big thing for us. When we first started off, a lot of our figures came compla complaining, saying, okay, I don't know what these are, but uh, it was re really alien looking nematodes. Uh, it freaked the living daylights out of me and a lot of our figures, but we we researched and we got in touch with a lot of our, our key expert friends in figging in around the world. And we kind of discovered that, you know, a good way or a good method that really works for us over here was actually using uh, the pathogen free chicken manure. All right. So it's really interesting how you want to mix it. The ratio, I think it's experimental. Uh, you need to find out the right formula for you that works in your home micro environment, you know, that really works for you. So that's how the, the draining uh, of the water and uh, you will eventually find the right formula. Uh, if you do want to know the ratio, you can ask Dr. Fick later on. <laughs> he does the manual work. All right. The other topic that I want to talk about relating to soil, um, we realize with the potting culture, it works for us. It's beneficial for us in many ways. But the, one of the key challenges we face is uh, actually compaction of soil. Yeah, regardless whether we put rice hull or husk or biochar, eventually over time, due to the watering of the, the plant, uh, the impact and pressure kind of push all the, the soil and complex it somehow. And that's not good because remember the soil, the, the roots need, you know, to need room to grow and they need, um, they just need space to grow and they can't be compacted in that sense. So we actually discovered that some of our plants in the pots, uh, the soil has they actually become rock hard, really rock hard. Uh, the first symptom or signs that you can actually know uh, is by looking at the plant itself. When it looks as if it's balding, it's shedding leaves, uh, and it starts to dry from the top, you know for sure uh, the root of the problem is the roots. All right, so you know for sure that the roots are not getting enough uh, water and nutrients that you have been feeding it. So, and that could be a result of soil compaction. So what we've done many a time is to kind of repot the whole thing. And that's the reason why we chose polybag because it's really easy for us to maintain. All we need to do is cut it down and then, you know, re-soil the whole uh, thing and repot it basically without hurting the roots, uh, the root ball, okay? In terms of nutrient feeding, um, the holy mantra, and, and I know all of you are experts in gardening, um, feed the soil, not the plant. Yeah, so we do have our really regimented approach where we do foliar sprays, uh, you know, feeding them from the leaves, and we also feed the soil. So um, we've done a lot of, um, you know, spraying, and we do put a lot of, um, you know, organic matters in it, uh, and on compost and so forth. So know what's best for your plants. Um, the thing about figs we discussed cover, some of the fig uh, cultivars, uh, they really bruise very easily. Um, so amongst other things that we do include in our feeding would be calcium. Just like some of the tomatoes here, it's strange enough, I just want to bring this really nice story about tomatoes in, in Singapore and Malaysia. Um, they, they were, they were you know, times when I buy tomatoes and I, I've sharpened the knife and everything, I try to cut it and cut, I, it just refused to be cut. I couldn't slice it for whatever not. Then I, I spoke to um, Dr. Fake and he claimed that, okay, I think they've been overfeeding them with calcium. So that's, what, that's when we discovered that, you know, essentially calcium allows that, that thick layer of skin or the skin kind of toughens up a little bit. And it, it actually works. So we have been introducing calcium uh, into our uh, plants, especially those that are actually already fruiting. So it's really cool. I, I really want you guys to actually try, uh, try it out and test it out as well. 
Okay, so in terms of uh, pH, uh, we maintained uh, a 5.5 to 6.5, uh, and that actually works for you know nutrient absorption and growth. In and in the event, if you do need to raise the soil pH, uh, there are a couple of methods as well. I put in two methods over here. I, I know there's a third method. I think uh, that's a little bit complicated for me to explain, but I think what really works for us uh, was actually or using agricultural lime and dolomite. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Now comes the fun part, cultivars. Um, so I'm going to feature a couple of figs, uh, that the top 20 figs, so to speak, uh, that, that are pretty much the fig queen's favorite. Um, I've kind of chosen them uh, based on their taste, uh, on how they look, sometimes because of their names, uh, and the history behind the figs. Just remember, figs, um, it wasn't the apple that Adam and Eve Eight. It was the figs because if you look at the fig, uh, the fig leaves is actually uh, the, if you look at the leaf, it's actually fig leaf. So some believe it is purple Jordan uh, uh, fig that they ate. But yeah, so this fruit has been around since the day since day one. All right, and it, it is in most of our holy books and most religion. Uh, the one thing I have to note uh, and kind of share my personal experience with figs or growing figs is that uh, truthfully, what's, what's stated in, in the books, uh, it actually helped my family, honestly, because um, it says it's beneficial for in terms of health and so forth. Uh, I, I believe it is really good for weight loss. Yeah, I, I've lost quite a lot of weight just eating figs. Uh, it's anti-aging, re reverse aging, um, it, it allows the family in terms of, uh, it allows and supports the family in terms of uh, economic as well. So there are a lot of things to be, you know, to leverage on when you grow figs. You can do fig tea leaves, uh, you, can, you can sell the figs, you can sell the, the cuttings and cultivars. Um, and if you do it really smartly, you can actually reap a lot of um, good income from it, yeah? So to begin, my favorite cultivars, if you can see, the first one is actually CDA. In short, um, what it means is Constantin de Algeri. Uh, it's from Algeria. Um, and we, it was actually you know, transported out of Algeria with legal papers, of course. But once, uh, when we, what we notice about this cultivar is that it actually, it, it's actually, you know, it, uh, it, it's actually amazing because it grows like a bigger than a tennis ball. Uh, the thing about Asians here in Singapore and Malaysia, because uh, they really love big stuff. They really love big things. It's a little bit different from uh, the other region, like the European figures, because they love the small, petite, sweet figs because they are so wonderful. The taste is so compact. When they see big figs, they run because... On, only because the taste is not as sweet. It's mildly sweet. It's actually good for people with um, high sugar level or uh, diabetes and so forth. But it, it's one of it, it's a beauty in the, in the eyes of the beholder. So some of the Chinese here actually love the big big face because look at that. It looks like a gold nugget, and gold nuggets uh, represents prosperity. So a couple of times uh, we get uh, requests, you know, asking, you know, Mika, can I have a CDA because I want to give it to a friend because. It, it kind of represents prosperity. So CDA is one of them. Um, and it's actually good for dried figs. Um, because the thing is, the dried figs, if you were to choose a lighter colored uh, external skin uh, figs, the, when, it, it, when it's dried, it doesn't look so dark or black in a sense. So it still kind of maintain a nice uh, shiny uh, light color uh, when they are dried. Another thing that I wanted to go through is the super red hybrid. This is amongst the first five cultivars uh, we collected. Um, it was actually um, made available to us through a friend. Uh, really nice big figs, really super sweet. Um, and can you see that little tiny dots there? Um, I, I call it the stardust. It's really attractive in a sense. Um, it is a little bit... Um, soft uh, in, the, in the expect, uh, very sugary, and um, I, it's quite easy to, uh, to root and grow as well. 
So like what I mentioned, I, I fell in love with a couple of them, mainly because of the names. So check it out, the name, Bellezza Nera della Siciliana. And of course, it came from Sicily. Oh, it's a wonderful one. Especially when it grows uh, under the sun, it really turns to pitch dark black fig. Um, and it actually produced honey droplets as well. So a couple of things that we've learned along the way is how to eat figs. It's ridiculous. Uh, honestly, it's just not about, you know, some of them actually peel out the skin. But we've discovered the best way of eating um, figs would be actually eating it with the skin uh, and start from the bottom. That's where the sugar and honey actually resides. So we've done a lot of experiments, just closing our eyes, eating the figs from, from right from the osteol at the bottom. Uh, sometimes we actually cut it into half and you need to rub it in order to kind of accentuate the, the taste of it. And it's really wonderful experience in that sense. All right. Um, then comes uh, Fix with Stories. So you have uh, Del Monte that was actually first found uh, in the mountains. And um, I've got another story behind right after this slide as well. So many multiple figs that I've got here on this slide. Um, amongst others, the Fig de Soliers, very popular in France. It is one of their native um, cultivars there. And often than not, during the fig season, you have them in loads in the market. Um, and you can see how petite that looks, but they can actually grow to a medium size in France, only because uh, they are what they eat. Uh, they get different nutrients here in this part of the world because of the rain and, and so forth and the climate. So they differ slightly. But they, of course, we do have the super fix that kind of maintain the characteristics um, uh, when they come here as well. Then we have Molinat, um, which is really nice and a little bit seedy though, but I do like it because it is really good for drying, um, dried figs. And, and we have Capolach and so forth. And I think you kind of noticed the bricks reading as well. So we we have taken pains to kind of um, document the sweetness level of our figs. Um, so we've done a couple of tests and the children themselves have actually learned how to do this because it is really um, quite cumbersome sometimes. But we've done uh, and discovered a lot of good figs through the BRICS reading. So some of the figures that want to start collection, they actually refer to, to our BRICS reading as well um, as part of, our, you know, making that decision. All right. So some of uh, the really cool ones over here, KTJ is a very new one. It's called Cafe Tijate. Uh, this is really good for mass production. Um, we've, I've done the bouncing test. And you know what's a bouncing test? It's literally throwing the fig on the ground or on the table. It actually bounces. So we discovered that, it's, uh, that the skin is good enough for you know, long travel or uh, delivery and so forth. And the taste is so exquisite, mind you. It's really mind-blowing. So KTJ is amongst my favorite. And of course, we have Love. Uh, love, when it first came to this part of the world, it was crazy expensive. They had a bit that happened and somebody actually bought it for close to 3,000 US for a small little sapling. I think it was just ridiculous. I didn't fall into that trap. I waited for all the price, uh, the price of uh, love to go down and actually got that. Uh, love is amongst, um, you know, the couple of crazy cultivars that people actually were chasing. Uh, the other one would be Ponti Tresa. Uh, I think some of you may have heard. They don't, the two don't really perform very well here in this region um, due to climate and, and so forth, but we are still studying the plants. Hopefully in the next couple of years, uh, they, they will produce really good figs. So the other thing that I wanted to share with you is um, in the event, if you do try some of these cultivars and after the first year or the first produce, they are really disappointing looking, they're not tasting really well, be patient. All right, allow the plant to grow. The first produce are never perfect, except, you know, our firstborn child, but they, they are never perfect. Give them time, let the tree mature. As it mature and ages, it produces, uh, it, it can produce really beautiful figs, all right? Um, we've noticed, and on average, uh, after the second or even the third harvest, only then they are near perfect, all right? So this is one cool tip that I can actually provide and share with you. Um, this, this page, this is cool. I uh, remember the names I love. So one of them is actually Leopoldo Abruzzo. And it's only a few of us who have Leopoldo. Uh, remember we are collectors, yeah? So I, I went to great lengths to get it. Uh, beautiful, sweet, 
a fig with a, a brief middle reading of 28. The name Leopoldo Abruzzo, if you were to translate it, means the donkey under the bridge. How classy can that be? Um, it, it's, yeah, it sounds really classy if you don't know the language, but the donkey under the bridge literally means the first time Leopoldo Abruzzo was found, it was found under the bridge, near the donkey. All right, so that's the cool history. And I just love some of, his, some, some of the stories of the, uh, the figs that we have collected. Saint Germain is another one. Um, we are proud to say that, uh, again, it's a handful of us who hate Saint Germain. Um, and not many got their trees to fruit. So we have been really fortunate and lucky to have St. Germain uh, fruiting in our garden. It's so beautiful. The taste, it, stay, it tastes like strawberry, honestly. Then we have TC12. Um, some of you, you may start asking me, why are some of the figs cultivars having numbers behind? Very simple. It's just like their postal code. Uh, if you notice some of them were actually brought out from conservatories, all right? So we I've got in touch with some of the master collectors that have maintained conservatories around the world, and they do have, you know, the, the trees in postal code address, you know, is their address. Um, so you have like what you call TC12, Maroc 23, Baleres 1, Baleres 2, Baleres 3. So these are actually names of the fakes or more like their address or uh, where they sit in the conservatory. So some of them have not been renamed. Uh, talking about renaming, we don't rename any of our fakes. Um, in the event that if you do know anyone renaming, some of the renaming renaming of figs are really ridiculous. You get like golden ram, rainbow something such. It's not classy to me to rename it. So um, ethically, we uh, we hold true to our heart. Um, we, we don't rename any of our fig cultivars. We see them as it is. In the event if they were to, supposed to be the same, it is what it is. So we have things uh, on an occasion where we have cornadria, for example. Cornedria actually starts in, um, in France. It's near the wall of the, the church. So they call it Cornedria de France. So that means Cornedria from France. Then some of them decided to drop the France. So, but the fruits actually differ. Uh, Cornedria de France is much sweeter, nicer, and bigger compared to the normal Cornedria. So again, we just maintain uh, the names of the fig cultivars that we have in our garden. Um, the one over here that I wanted to show, Kanijanka. Uh, I think it's a cool fig because the name is quite cool, uh, Kanijanka. Uh, we, we have Black Odessa that came from Turkey. Uh, we have Gros Long Verde uh, that looks really cool, but unfortunately it's a little bit hollow in, in the middle, but it's extremely creamy uh, on the exterior. Yeah. Um, so again, you need to identify the taste of the figs. It can be melony, it can be honey, and, you know, it can be really creamy at the same time. So. This is a mixture of all the other figs that we have uh, that are really, you know, worth mentioning. Um, you know, I'd like to thank uh, Parajal, Pure Fine, Archipel. Okay, this sounds really silly, but, but yeah, they're really nice figs, yes, to have. And uh, most of I'm featuring, about 80% that I've featured so far are prolific. Um, i.e. what that means would be, you know, they, they really fruit in abundance. And the beautiful part about the tropics, the fig produce the fig trees produce figs all year round, okay? So that's really wonderful for fig farmers because uh, you can kind of, you know, reap profit from the whole thing. But the only challenge or the only bad part about the whole thing, and I really feel bad about the figs, honestly, is because they grow continuously. We don't get winter, so they don't get a break. When they don't get a break, um, they actually go through what they call a uh, bi nail, uh, hang on, by nail, hang on, I can't remember this name, uh, Ryan actually, or my Dr. Fee actually said a couple of times, as BNR effect. So he'll mention it later on um, about it. So essentially what happens is the, the fig don't get rest um, when they get really, um, you know, sick and tired of producing figs in the most layman fashion, uh, I would say they just shut down. Uh, they'll just refuse to, to grow and uh, they, they just refuse to produce. It's really very sad. Some of the trees are really, you know, they've grown really tall and big, um, but they just, re they just slowly die in a sense. So often than not, we have to do really quickly backups of the, the cultivars and start regrowing it from fresh. It's quite painful, all right? 
Okay, so amongst the 700 cultivars that we have, uh, this is the documentation that we did uh, or have uh, or are still doing basically. Uh, it's actually the, the side window uh, of the house. Uh, we decided, you know, I, I found that this is most effective because uh, in most times, um, either the birds get to the fix first or my children will get to the fix first. So I more often than not do pick uh, or harvest the figs and quickly put them on the windowsill and start documenting it. So it serves as a good reference to a lot of our figures and collectors because some of them say, um, actually ask, how does it taste? How does it look like? You know, um, and this is a good reference point for most of them because uh, honestly, with the 700, it can be quite challenging for me to remember all of them and their characteristics. So this is, this is a really, really good uh, documentation. So. Yes, you can see beautiful figs over here. Uh, can you see the Jacques Cartier? It can grow really big. Um, Osborne prolific. It can, it's really prolific and really huge figs. Uh, then you get really um, cute names like Boji Hong that came from China. So there are a couple of Chinese uh, figs uh, like Boji Hong and even Wuhan. Wuhan is actually very nice, guys, uh, minus the COVID, yeah. Um, then we have Nera Siciliano. Um, let me see anything else. Yeah, gutissimo peretta. So again, it's about choices. So if um, if you want to start, you know, growing figs or producing figs for commercial, uh, my my first advice is to really study the cultivars, get to know uh, some figures, and ask them about the experience growing the cultivars. Um, ask them what works and what doesn't. Yeah. So I'm just going to go quickly to the next slide over here. So there's some of them uh, really really treasured amongst our collectors. Uh, they could be in the family of the Rimada and a couple of uh, Rimadas that, we, uh, that are available. There's a BNR uh, and so forth here, yeah? Martinanka Rimada. And the thing about the Rimadas, why are they popular? And they are still very expensive, everyone. So the thing about the Rimadas uh, is the exquisite taste plus the exterior, it just looks so nice and variegated, yeah? So it's beautiful. Um, so it's something worth considering if you are into collecting them. Um, then let me see. All right, I think that's about it generally. In summary, um, if you do want to go into figging, uh, the first question you need to ask yourself is, what type of figure are you? Uh, just like us, we still maintain the positioning of being hobbyists uh, plus collector. The advanced um, form of hobbyist is collector. So the reason why I want you to dwell on this really, really carefully before you start figuring is because um, the hobby can be really expensive. Um, it all starts with the cultivar. The cultivars can be really uh, be so expensive, uh, especially when they are very rare. So some are fetching like US dollars 200 and 300. Honestly, in, in my opinion, it's ridiculous, but people do pay for a good money for those cultivars, right? Only because they want to be amongst the, the handful that, that have that cultivars. The other reasoning would be they want to cultivate and propagate and, and resell it. So it, there's no right or wrong to that, but I think essentially, um, you know, I really urge every one of you to really consider um, figuring out what kind of figure are you. If you do want to go into commercial growing of figs, uh, there, there's lots of uh, pockets of money to earn. Um, you know, right from selling the first produce would be the figs, uh, the tea leaves, uh, even the saplings or, or the cultivars and cuttings. Uh, there are also consideration, uh, there are also opportunity for you to kind of, um, you know, go into secondary products. I've tasted the most wonderful uh, produce, uh, secondary produce from figs. Uh, they can be fig jams, uh, it can be fig cookies, it can be, you know, um, even fig tea leaves uh, mixed with moringa leaves. Oh, it's just wonderful. If you haven't tasted the fig, um, fig jam uh, that we have, you know, I urge all of you to try making them uh, in your homes. Uh, fig ice cream is another. It's, uh, it's a very unique taste that you can actually, you know, uh, get from using figs. 
Um, nowadays, commercially, people are using fix for yogurt and so forth. So there's some consideration and there's some opportunity that you might want to consider if you do want to go uh, into the commercial aspect of fix. All right, so what's next? Uh, I'm all up and running. I want to go into figging. So again, my big, big advice. Uh, now there are a lot more information available uh, globally uh, in all the social media. Do read, read, and read. Uh, do join the FIG groups that are available globally. Um, Ryan and myself uh, are admins for FIG World and uh, FIG Addiction. Um, there are really good FIG groups in, in the United States uh, globally as well. Please go and join them. There are a lot of really nice people who are there to help. They don't want to see you fail. So please do join and, and you know, read up as much as possible. Uh, in the event, if all things fail, you can just drop me a line. I'll be more than happy to help. All right, experiment first. Uh, don't, don't put in all your investment very quickly into it. Uh, pace yourself out. It's good to kind of budget and pace yourself out. Even if you're growing figs in your garden, honestly, pace it out. All right. Um, get cuttings and saplings from your friends who may have it. Experiment first before you go, bo you know, jump both feet in. So again, um, it's all about budgeting and, and sustaining the hobby. And then one reason why we went into a small little mini bus business uh, in a sense, uh, in selling cuttings or, you know, some of our products, mainly because we wanted to sustain the hobby. It is a very expensive hobby. So there are methods of generating income to feed your hobby, yeah? So don't just, you know, take out the, the, your cash and everything, just and invest in it without getting uh, any money out of it, all right? So that's all, actually. So these are come some of the pictures of uh, what kind of figure you are. So you have the collector figure who look at brick, brick, bricks meter. You got a crazy collector who kisses every cutting that they get when they pay so much. <laughs> Trust me, it was painful. And you have the farmers who actually, you know, grow, uh, grow them in, in masses. And, and, and it's, it's a beautiful experience, honestly, if you do, uh, if you're capable of uh, growing uh, it in, into a commercial, um, you know, farm in a sense. All right. So more information about us. Uh, we've got about 200, uh, close to 200 videos that we have uh, done over six or seven years already. Um, and I'm happy to answer any question. Uh, the, some of the videos are a bit crazy, but I just, like what I said, I just want to inject a, a little bit more fun into, uh, you know, in, into teaching people and, and spreading the love for fix. That's all from me, Ty. Over to you. Thank you, Mika. That was amazing. Your photos, oh, thank you. Come out, your photos come out so amazing. And uh, <laughs> the documentation that you've done is really awesome. I love uh, that big spread of all the uh, dozens and dozens of figs on the windows. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so, all right, looks like we've had a lot of questions and Dr. Fig has been on top of it in terms oh, of cool. that window. So there's actually a really healthy dialogue happening. Very uh, nice. I'll throw out some questions that are just popping up. Um, Actually, it was one a little bit back. Um, do you do a lot of grafting or what root stock and how many grafts per tree if you do? Okay, I shall answer that. Uh, personally, I'm not a grafter. I'm horrible at it. Um, I know there are a lot of master grafters in the United States, uh, really good fit grafters. I personally do a lot of cuttings um, as well as um, air layering in terms of propagating. So I can't answer that, but you know, my advice for grafting, I think get from the, the key experts in, in grafting, but when it comes to air layering, for, air layering, for example, uh, the maximum that you can go is maybe four because you don't want to stress the plant up. If you do stress it up, you're going to lose the entire tree. So just be very mindful of that. In terms of cuttings, you know, sometimes you want to kind of, you know, trim and train the, trim the, the tree. What we do is, um, there are many ways of identifying why you need to do it in the first place. If you see that the plant is not doing very well and you need to do a backup very quickly, you need to trim it all the way down to about one foot above the soil leaving a couple of notes. That way, it stresses the plant to, okay, I still need to survive, and they will just shoot out uh, with the leaves and branches. So one feet a bit above the, the ground, and the remaining sticks right, right from the one foot to, towards the end, you can make cuttings and so forth. Um, so yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I can't answer about the grafting part of things, but I think um, 
there are a lot of uh, our figures who actually brought cuttings from us. Uh, they enjoy our cutting because it's huge, uh, it's long, so they get, get to graft it out uh, using those cuttings there. Uh, there was a question on how to get a bricks reading off of a fig since they don't tend to have a proper juice as like a, that jammy type of texture that they have. Yeah, we, we, we did a lot of squeezing and, you know, I, and I put it into a grinder as well. I just try to get the, the juice out somehow. You just have to do whatever it takes to get some juice out from the figs. That, yeah, so that, that's what we've been doing. Okay. Do you have a specific tool that you use for the squeeze or anything? No, what you can do is you can grind it a little bit and put into the nylon like blender, uh, cloth. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. like a blender and um, just put into the, the nylon, like the cheese cloth. cloth. Cheese cloth, yeah. right, right, right. Okay. You just have to find ways on in getting the juice out somehow. Right. Um, all right. Seems like a lot of questions again were answered in the chat window. Does anyone have any additional questions? Feel free to type it in the chat. About the number of figs in the world, we I, we actually discovered that the fig collectors around the world have actually kind of um, gave a number to it. It's about 1,900 documented mm. figs. Wow. Um, someone asked, are there any recommendations in terms of cultivars for starting a scion bank and experimenting in West Africa, where people are only familiar with wild figs? How do you make decisions on what cultivars to start experimenting with if people don't know the different flavors. Right. You can find that some information in our site, but I think to begin with, don't get the expensive ones first. All right. Fine. Honestly, you try to get the the, the, the most common ones are like the uh, brown turkey, super red hybrid, uh, Masui dolphin, um, common ones that are available from everyone. Um, I think, Jerry, you need to, like what I say, you need to read up a little bit more before you start, um, you know, collecting the figs. And always test out because I, I can't guarantee the weather in South Africa, West Africa, and, and the other regions, basically. But that's what we did. We, we started off on ground zero uh, and, and experimenting um, the different cultivars. Dr. Fig did mention that there's a Japanese bricks meter uh, where you can squeeze the moist pulp into it. Yeah. Um, it's expensive though. Okay. It's very expensive, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, any root pruning advice? Root pruning advice, uh, we've done a couple actually, and that's when the trees have actually become really mature. Um, only because, it, because of potting culture, we want to ensure that the tree actually survive uh, longer. So we have done, you know, we actually take off all the soil and root prune um, to a square, not destroying the root ball. And that's quite critical. You just have to do it very delicately because uh, the root ball, if you, the, the slightest break to the root ball, we actually, you know, is the heart. It will just, you just cry, honestly. So just be very careful about that. Not to, don't be so too salvage, uh, savage and, and really cut it to really tiny ball, but allow it some, you know, some, a good mess basically to begin with when you do that root pruning. Okay. Do you still have your finger lime collection? Oh yeah, <laughs> I do. It's so well, nice, my God. How many varieties do you have? I believe, I think it's about 18. In mm. total, mm. I've got Jabotikaba as well. I think I kind of mm. mentioned that to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been following a guy on YouTube who uh, has a collection in Florida, um, mm. Flying Fox Fruits and Jabotikaba. He's got a very large collection. Nice. I told you I met a figure in Singapore. Uh, I met up, I was delivering his fig plant. It was up on the 40th floor. It's an apartment and he has a huge tree, a Jabotikawa tree in his apartment. I don't know how he got his plant there. It was, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience picking out the fruits. It's on his balcony or it was on the roof? In the balcony. Nice. nice. Um, okay. Um, and I have a question on the finger limes. So mm -hmm. what are the variances in the finger limes that you've found? Because I've seen kind of coloration on the outside, but is there a lot of difference in Anything else? It's more the pulp actually tied. So you have the pink ones and the 
the yellow ones, the red champagne is wonderful. I can share this with you. Um, it, unfortunately, it grows really very slowly for us, but the, because of the sun, it's able to fruit quite well for us as well. But uh, when we got it, it was really very tiny. Mm -hmm. It was a graph actually. So we waited for close to three years for it to start fruiting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of feeding, a lot of uh, nutrient feeding by Dr. Fick in mm -hmm. allowing it to grow. And again, if they're all uh, grown in poly bags. Dr. Fig did mention on the root pruning subject that um, you've got to cut off or prune the branches as well to get it all proportionate to how much you prune the roots. Good tips. Um, John Valenzuela said, please no citrus importation. <laughs> yes, please take note of that. That's why I said I'm not selling, yeah? This is pure information. Right, uh, yeah enough challenges there. How do you, I have a question on how you work with shipping genetics internationally. So how does, how does that all work? We often ask the, the buyer if, uh, they, we often put the onus on the buyer first to really mm -hmm. check on the agricultural um, policies and so forth we can, before we can start shipping. Uh, in terms of paperwork, we're more than happy to, to follow through the paperwork because uh, Dr. Fig is a little bit of a chicken because he doesn't like to break rules. Even crossing the road, he still follows the, the traffic line and so forth. So if there any paperwork for us to, to complete, please let us know uh, in the event that, you know, we don't want to get into trouble. We don't want you to get into trouble as well. So um, we rather do, you know, do the import papers and so forth. So in front, between Singapore and Malaysia, we do um, declare all our plants. Uh, we go to the aviation, um, the agriculture department to get our papers done be before we bring our plants in. So do it the most legit ways, if, uh, if I may advise everybody. All right. Um, there was mention of a potential group purchase of Scion Wood. If we were to have our club organize a purchase through you, would it be easier to just have one set of paperwork, I guess? Yes, 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 definitely, definitely. Okay. Right, we'll bring that up with the chapter. Um, all right, there was a shout out for Malaysian durian. Uh, are you a durian fan? Oh yes, I am. I love my durian because um, all my four pregnancies, I, I had, I crave for durian. Unfortunately, Dr. Fig is, he, he doesn't eat durian. So he actually, he, he got me outside the house and locked me outside the house and I had my durian on my own. Can you beat that? <laughs> but it was, yeah, I, I, I have to have my durian. That's funny. Uh, do your kids, what's their, <laughs> what's their favorite fruits, the kids? Uh, if you ask the youngest one, it would be figs. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them are monkeys, so they love our bananas. Nice. Um, have you tasted the variegated bananas? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. it just look, they look like commandos to me, you know? Nice. Not only the leaves the are fruit? very... Yeah, the, the nice. leaves are variegated. The fruits are also variegated. The, of nice. course, it's the skin. So they love the bananas. Uh, they love jackfruit. Uh, they love the sapotes. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually grow all them in, in our vicinity as well. Which sapotes? I don't know which one, but the 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 smaller White ones, ones the or black ones, or chico the, sapote. The chicos, the chi yeah. yes, that's the one. Sapodilla. Okay. Mm. Yes. Um. All right. Okay, Doctor Figs, make a mention for folks that aren't following the chat. I'll just repeat some of this, but. Um, yeah. Between Singapore and Malaysia, uh, you guys arrange for import permits and phytosanitary certificates. Um, but he's heard that it's easier if you have a nursery license or something to import mm. easily into the USA. Correct. Um, but it's best to follow the rules. But we do have some nursery connections around in Orange County, so that That's could be good. possible. Um, That's good. Good deal. Yeah, do leverage on, you know, if you, like what I said, do, the, do it the legit way. Uh, we've collected over the years really good cultivars. And um, often than not, we love to see how the cultivars are actually performing in different regions. Because mm -hmm. bear in mind, um, some of them are really in nooks and corners of the world, in the mountains mm -hmm. and in, in, in what not have you. So it'd be really interesting for us to research the, how it performs in the different part of the world. Do you guys actually travel to go find figs elsewhere or is most of it purchasing through uh, collectors around? That's a very interesting question. Um, 
we try to travel and get them. Uh, but hand on heart, we, we actually lies a lot with uh, the master collectors because it's the most econom economical way mm -hmm. of doing it. I am in the travel trade, so I used to travel quite a bit. Um, uh, I used to travel like three times in, in a month. Uh, so I, I do get to bring back some, um, some cuttings and so forth or get them shipped out um, from the source country as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a combination of both. But it just makes logical sense. Um, it's more economical in the sense to get it from master collectors rather than traveling to get one piece of steak. But they are crazy collectors, yeah, who actually does that. So how would you describe a master collector? Would you be now a master collector over time? Um, I, I, believe, uh, I believe that we are, uh, only because I think uh, we are amongst the top five in the world right now to have collected so many. Uh, the one, even, even if, in, if you were to include the, the, the conservatories in that sense, uh, the likes of Montserrat and Paolo Bologna, if we were to look at um, most of us, we have more than at least 500 collect, uh, collection of cultivars. Some I know have about 1,100. Um, mm. I think ours is about 700, some about 400 plus or so. So I, I know of some collectors in the United States that have about 300, 400 um, collect, uh, cultivars in total. I believe Khaled said he's got 500. I don't know if that's true. That okay, uh, it's time for, for me to get in touch with Khaled. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, yeah, maybe, maybe it's got to go in the reverse now. Yeah, it, um, it's, it's a crazy addiction, Tai. It's a crazy yeah. addiction. Totally. We've all been bit by at least one fruit addiction, um, uh -huh. if not many. Um, so Dr. Fig mentioned that there was a plan to visit Paolo in Pomona yes. last April. So who's Paolo? Uh, is, he's Dr. Paolo Belloni. He actually maintains the Pomona Garden. Uh, a lot of our um, a collection actually came from him. He's a, he's a very very passionate Italiano, you know. So he holds on to his cultivar to his like his dear life. He doesn't release it to anybody. Uh, we some of us had to beg him to release some. That Leopoldo Abruzzo is actually from his garden. You know, if you were to talk to him, he'll just say, No, no, I, I can't sell it to you, that kind of stuff. But uh yeah, I'm dying to go to Pomona. We actually got our tickets book. Unfortunately due to COVID we, we had to cancel everything. So I'm I'm we are planning, planning to hopefully go there maybe in September next year. And of course, the U.S. will come first. Uh, we see how that goes. And that's Pomona in California? No, Dr. Paolo. Uh, no, 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 no. It's in Italy. Pomona, Italy. Mm. I've never heard of that. Because I live in Pomona, California. <laughs> I was ah. like, I've never, I've never heard of this guy. Um, great. That explains my Italian accent, you see. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, all right. There's a question, are there any varieties that are much more productive than the rest? Yes. And Dr. Fig has his response. You can give a different one. But the CDA and SJDK are prolific yes. and huge, um, at a, averaging 150 grams. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that also Piccolo Lojoso. Um, yeah. Good deal. Yeah. And mind you, we only grow them in poly bags, yeah? Again, it's potting culture and it can actually grow that big. Um, only because of the cultivar, the characteristics of the cultivar, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it's interesting. Some cultivars, you know, you just have to really study the plant. Some, one, one side of the branch actually gives really big ones. Mm -hmm. One side of the branch gives really small figs. So you need to cull the mm -hmm. one that gives you small one and maintain the one that gives you really big ones. It's just logical mm -hmm. sense. And I believe um, it might work for some of the fruits as, uh, fruit trees as well. It's quite interesting, yeah. the ways uh, Mother Nature work. I was actually climbing around in a big fig tree today, harvesting yeah. fruits uh, for a friend's organization. And uh, I thought about you because I thought of how skinny and small your figs are. Yes. And that you, might, you might be jealous of how yes. big this one tree was. I'm dying to try yeah. climbing onto a tree. It's really tight. I'm really dying for it. I'm <laughs> craving for that. Yeah, well, you could do a Pomona tour where you go to Pomona, California, and then Pomona, Italy. <laughs> All right, I'll take it on. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, and this tree, I don't think it gets much water, uh, which is quite amazing what figs mm. can do as a Mediterranean plant. Um, we get about 12 inches of rainfall a year, um, and you guys get, I don't know, many, many, many fold that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, 
other questions? So there's mention of using poly bags being very cheap um, and UV resistant and easily available. I'll also mention I've experimented with these um, uh, fabric pots that mm -hmm. work very well um, mm, as containers. Okay. Yeah, um, okay. They can dry out on the sides. So there's some fabric pots that actually have liners on the upper edge to keep them from drying. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a love and hate relationship with me and uh, the, the, those bags. Mm -hmm. we, we started off using uh, those bags for seedlings first. The really tiny ones uh, mm -hmm. for seedlings. It really worked wonderfully because it allows the aeration and so forth. But when, when we decided to go for the bigger ones, there are a couple of challenges because we need to kind of put markings on it for the names right. on the bag. The bags actually turn moldy after a while, mm. the fungus, the green fungus. So you can't actually see the names on it. That mm. was a big challenge for us. And we do it in mass. We right. have like two, three hundred at one go of cuttings and saplings. So the name thing got, it disappeared and uh, it dries up very well. And you're absolutely right on that one. And after a while, it looks quite ugly as well. It's not very nice to see when they look very mm. moldy and so forth. Aesthetically, it's not there I, I don't quite like it so it doesn't look very clean um yeah it, it disintegrate quite nicely into the earth you know it's a, it's more safe for the earth it's like that i agree but i think at the end of the day you, you potentially need to to figure out how to counter all the the negative impact of that somehow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the one word i forgot uh, i think dr fick and that kind of um i was i stumbled on the word just now was the bbe by nail uh by nail bearing effect. Okay, I could still never say that word. Uh, it's a very interesting term. I, I, I beg all of you to read a little bit more about it if you are into um, potting culture, especially in this part of the world. Uh, remember I told you that they keep growing and growing um, all year round, uh, that, that they don't get rest, there's no winter. So it, that BBE uh, effect comes into play as well. So you just need to be very quick in uh, coming off your backup in a sense. Uh, there was a question on the parentage of the super red hybrid. Is anyone, are you aware of the parentage of that? Okay, I, um, super red hybrid, I think Ryan, Dr. Fit will write a little bit more on that. Um, I believe it came from uh, Taiwan, if I'm mistaken, from one of the um, Taiwanese professors uh, that discovered this huge fake. Um, there's some similarities in some of the figs, the likes of super red hybrid, super jumbo, masui dolphin. If you look at the characteristics of the, the fig, it doesn't differ that much. It's red fig, very big, very juicy. Sweetness level is not that um, fantastic, honestly. It's, it's mildly sweet. It's not seedy. So I see some si similarity in, in these three figs, basically. So if you do want to consider red figs, these are really good cool to have. Uh, the heritage of a super red hybrid, I believe it strongly possibly came from Taiwan, but I can see what I'll ask whether Dr. Ryan um, can confirm that. Dr. Fick. Yeah? Um, yeah. He had mentioned about Taiwan and nurtured by a Taiwanese professor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I also had uh, John, my friend John mentioned something. I've had an interesting experience I was going to mention yesterday and I forgot. Mm -hmm. um, so with the latex that fig trees produce, mm -hmm. um, especially when there's an unripe fig, uh, they'll still have the white latex in there. And uh, have you noticed working with it, or you or anyone else, where you get um, kind of irritation on the skin? Oh, yeah. The sap when pruning a tree, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen uh, some figures actually collecting the latex and uh, producing cheese out of it that that's quite interesting uh but yes be very mindful when you handle figs because if it's uh, not ripe that we i've gotten burns it's literally yeah. burns yeah it, mm -hmm. it, it may start with an itch it may not start with an itch but the marks are really horrible uh yeah. so be very careful so what i've done um bef uh, that, that really pretty much will either put a layer of cream hand cream uh or even olive oil before you handle them and that kind of a uh, acts as a protective uh, layer before you mm. the, the the latex hit on your skin. Almost like when we cut open jackfruits, we'll uh, oil the oil. knife and oil That's our hands, correct. which is correct. also kind of sketch to be having an oiled hand with a knife on it. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, but I actually had uh, two days after pruning a tree that I'd pruned many years prior. Um, I went camping two days later, had an itchy sensation on my wrists and arms, but mm. didn't have any response. Two days later, I actually had boils on my skin. Yes. Like, uh, but that, that were burns. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, that's correct. And I read that it's actually um, breaking down proteins, the latex. Mm. And so it literally is like eating the skin. And Correct. It and it could be used as a meat tenderizer as well. <laughs> so yes. for those same properties. So you've got to uh, be very careful. So often and not when you're doing your air layering, when you do air layers, you have to, um, you have to wear gloves, seriously. Right. It, it can be quite painful. Right. Okay. Um, let me see. A Netflix show apparently calls it milk rather than latex, which I guess would make the cheese reference more <laughs> direct. Okay. Um, okay. Ooh. It's got, someone's been burned on their face by the rough leaf. The leaf oh. also has this, like, that texture. It's almost yes. like a hair, like a comfy leaf. Um, it yeah. cuts. It really cuts. Yeah. Mm. yeah. On a very minute level, yeah. Um, is it, and someone asked, oh, this is a great one. I've never heard of the tea, uh, the leaves being used for tea. Um, mm -hmm. So is it all fig leaves, young ones, older ones, um, any specific okay. varieties or all of them? No specific varieties. I think if you have never done or grow figs, the first thing that comes to mind, the, the first thing that hits you will be the smell of the leaves. Honestly, I think if you're virgin figures, uh, you'll smell that, that beautiful, beautiful fragrant. Um, so in my opinion, I mean, they, they are of course really good uh, cultivars. I, I would need to research on that. But I think for me, I'll just, my advice is if you do have fig, leaf, fig trees, um, just take the top young ones, the top five leaf young ones, the really nice baby ones. Uh, those are really nice for fresh fig tea leaves. Uh, wash them and then you just uh, put hot water and it's beautiful. It's very calming if you're a tea lover. Uh, in the event, if you do have nice big ones, you know, uh, you might want to wash and air dry it in the house, mm. not in the hot sun because all the nutrients will just go off. In the house, dry it out. Uh, you can crush it and again, um, pour hot water on it. You don't have to brew it in that sense. Mm. Cool. Uh, so Dr. Fig asked that I highlight that essentially you guys do not have a breba crop in your region. That's correct, right? So That's essentially correct. you're just getting the what's considered the main crop? Or... Main crop. Yeah. All throughout the year. Right. That's correct. Where certain varieties of figs, um, I don't know if you or Dr. Fig could clarify do you have a Brabo crop? Do all varieties have a Brabo crop? They're different quality, different types, right? Yes, they are. That? That's correct. So I think he's, uh, Dr. Fay has answered that, you know, we don't get Brabo crop here mainly because we don't get winter. So they don't right. go into the rest state. And then, you know, in the event that once winter, winter is over, that's the thing about Brabo. Once the winter is over, they, they just, there's this search to just, you know, give out right. fruits. So that's the reason why the fruits are really huge and they're called brebas. So we don't get that. Uh, so they're all main crops all throughout. Whether they, Of course, there are some really good uh, cultivars. Um, I don't know no, because I, we don't research that, but I think uh, we can try and find out what, which, are, uh, which are the cultivars that produce breba crop. There are some really nice tasting breba crops, but some breba crops are really mild, mild tasting and tasteless. Mm. So you just got to be very, um, very mindful of that as well. So, for example, with one tree, let's say one specific variety, how often are you getting fruit from that? Uh, we per, do per year. Get, yeah. Per year. Um, some, if we're lucky, we do get about three rounds of uh, feed produce. Um, you know, and the thing is, it takes quite a bit for us to wait for it to ripen. Uh, it goes all the way up to about 45 days or even 60 days. So right. it's quite painful to wait for the fruits. And then the, once it's almost ripe, um, the birds will come, you know, hovering around. <laughs> so we, we have our fetch share of challenges with the birds and the insects and everything. Right. Um, we, we came up with um, the bags, the organza bag. So I think that quite uh, quickly got caught on uh, in the world. Uh, we were actually amongst the very first few to kind of 
brand, hey guys, you can actually do the organza bag and so forth. Um, so we kind of have to come up with a couple of strategies in, in trying to get the birds out of the way, in a sense. What is the bag called? Organza. Organza. And organza it's like bags. a... Uh, what kind it's, of bag is it? It's a decorative bag. Um, you know, it's transparent in that sense that still allows the, uh, the the light to go in. So I always advise them if you want to go for uh, organza, or, uh, there you go, light mesh bags. Uh, try to go for the white and not the black or dark colored one, number one. Number two, try not to get the ones with patterns on it, like flowers mm. or butterfly on it, because in the event that if it gets stuck onto your fruit, you will have butterflies and, and flowers on your figs. It's ugly, all right? So you just want to maintain the true, uh, the true fig characteristic, characteristic in that sense. So get the light mesh bags in that sense and get it a little bit bigger and not too small. All right. What else? Any other? Um, do you guys have squirrels where you're at? No, we don't. Oh. We're lucky. <laughs> Definitely. Um, have you? If you do have a bird that eats part of a fig or another animal, will you still eat that fig if it's a special one? If it's partially yeah. Eaten? Yeah. We, we, we've done that. We've done the crazy stuff like, you know, cutting it. Yeah, we, we've done that. Yeah. My daughter is really good at that. <laughs> it's usually the most ripe ones that they took. Yes. Too, so, yeah. And we, you know, it's going to be, we were intending to pick it like in the next half an hour, one hour. Mm. And the birds came for it. It's, it's unbelievable. Mm. Totally. Right. There was mention of getting the orange organza bags so that they're um, visible. Uh, visible. So visible in the tree, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. But uh, yeah, again, I, I like the whites. I'm a very white person in that sense. <laughs> My polybags are white, so everything is pretty much white. Yeah, because you guys are having trees there, so I think the orange one might work. Hmm. Yeah, they're a lot more dense. Some of these canopies are very dense, yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Uh, there was a question on average kilogram of harvest per year per tree, um, or what is an expected range? But I guess you guys have unique circumstance in terms of how you manage yeah. the trees. So. Correct. Um, I think Dr. Fee has some data on that one. Um, but for home gardeners, you wouldn't expect in, in that much in, to begin with. But I've seen in fig farm, um, it can be close to a few... Um, it can be close. How much? Uh? Dr. Fee, can you please answer that? Can you confirm that? But it, it's it massive. We, they, they have actually transported fix daily to supermarkets and everything. So it goes by at least a few hundred kilos a day. Wow. Mm. Um, and so out of the products that you guys sell, uh, you sell fig cuttings. Um, mm -hmm. Do you sell rooted plants as well? Yes, we do. Locally um, more so? Or? We, we do it locally in Malaysia and Singapore. So we, mm -hmm. we do, um, we, we, we do de uh, deliver saplings in that sense. Um, I think over the years, we've, we've grown the fig collectors, um, the figures, the number of figures in Singapore to quite a considerable uh, number. I'm really proud of that because I think, I, I'm, ge I'm guessing in, in a few hundreds uh, in, in Singapore already, they are already, they are staying in uh, high-rise building in, in flats. Okay. It's ridiculous. I, I, I've visited houses where, you know, the, tree, the trees are literally perching out of the balcony. No, I can actually look from my, the car park on the ground level seeing, oh my God, that's the house I'm going to visit. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it, it's amazing to see how they actually are able to grow the fig in high-rise building. Uh, the one good tip that I always give them is walk your trees. Mm. Because they walk don't get the them. sun. Walk, not walk the dog, but walk the trees. So wherever the sun is, they usually wheel the plants to the tree, uh, to the sun. It's ridiculous, but it's fun in oh, a sense. Yeah. It's about adapting to what, you know, the, to the circumstances. So in Singapore, how close are you to the equator? Uh, very close. Um, very, very close. Uh, I think so you, you don't get a lot of sun swing on both sides or do you get a dramatic swing? I'm thinking of like an apartment with a balcony and how much the sun changes throughout the year. It, it, it does change uh, periodically. So I think it, 
some of my figures actually know, oh, Mika, my house only get the sun during the month of May. Some of them, you know, get it during in September. So yes, it, it does it does affect in that sense. So I, I'm trying to grow plants over here. I'm, I'm struggling trying to keep them, keeping them alive because of the lack of sun. Gotcha. Um, let's see. Uh, Dr. Fig mentioned that production is more than a ton of kilograms a month, um, but obviously you have to grow a higher producing crop like the CDA or the SJDK. Um, yeah. Wow. Isn't yeah? It's interesting because some trees actually, you know, every single node, there's a fruit. It's ridiculous. Like what, yeah. Remember, I told you it's not a tree. Yeah? It's just, to me, it's still a shrub or a plant, um, a mini right. tree in that sense. But every single node produces a fruit. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so Dr. Figgs mentioned about the high-rise buildings and the density blocks out sunlight. So Singapore has a very dense population. Is that correct? Um, like one of the more dense populations from what I understand. Is that true mm -hmm. or no? No, I don't think so. We've only no? got five, 5 million population. We've only 5 million strong. And uh, out of the 5 million, I think at least about 1 million um, of them are, you know, foreign workers and so forth. Uh, mm. Foreign national, not citizens, in, in, so to speak. So it's a very small nation. Mm. We are only 55 years old. In a right, sense. but the density in the space of the ah, country? Uh, like how many people? I, I, I thought that it was quite dense. Yes, it's it quite urban? dense. Yes, yes, yes. It's yeah. mainly urban. That's correct. It's only 26 miles long. <laughs> What's that, John? It's only 26 miles long. Yes, right. it's very tiny. Five million people within 26 miles. That, yeah, in terms of density, yes. <laughs> it, we are covered with high-rise buildings, unfortunately. Mm. All right. So, but you guys don't live in a high-rise. You have your own house and your own we, area. In Singapore, we are living in a high-rise. Okay. Uh, we moved all our plants into Malaysia. Only remember, I said the scarcity right. of land. So we, we wanted the see the thing is we wanted the kids to grow up knowing how does the cow look, how does the goat look, how does chicken right. behaves. So I think uh, it was a very good. Um, it was a very risky decision that we took, but it was a very good um, decision because I think eventually. Um, I love the fact that um, I've, we've inculcated the habit of growing, loving, uh, growing your own edibles, uh, loving nature, playing with soil, playing cricket and after after six o'clock and that kind of stuff. So, we most of our all our plants are in in JB Malaysia. So I think it was quite interesting a decision, but I, yeah, never regretted one bit. And so you do live part of the time in Singapore and part of the time in Malaysia, or how does yeah. that work? Um, the family is staying in Malaysia full gotcha. time. Uh, I have to work. I have to still bring gotcha. the money in to right. feed my husband's hobby. So <laughs> I work in Singapore. That's the money gen generating country for us at the moment. So yeah. Right. So I think I figured we need to kind of have a. I toyed with the idea of uh, having an early retirement and foc focusing on the fix alone with him, but I found out that um, it's not easy to work with your husband. Um, I also found out that I think I still want to wear my high heel shoes and bags. So. That's that's the reason why we kind of still maintain that, you know, I still have to work in Singapore, the rest of the plants and the family are in Malaysia, and um, I do return occasionally, if I can possibly every day, it's a causeway mm -hmm. away, about 45 minutes away to, my, to the house in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, if there's no traffic jam, if traffic jam can go <laughs> cut across like three hours, right, John? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but um, it's a mandatory thing for me to return to the family every weekend because um, my four kids plus the biggest baby, um, they need me somehow. Yeah, well, the cost of living is much cheaper in Malaysia than it is in Singapore. Exactly, John. I tell you, we can live on, um, our groceries can only be like one third of the, the amount I, I, I spend here in, in Singapore. It's ridiculous. I can, honestly, I can live with uh, uh, $500 Sing dollars, Singapore dollars uh, and feed the whole family in Malaysia for one month. That's incredible. I know the I've seafood, grown, yeah. Uh, yeah, seafood restaurants in JB are absolutely yes. fantastic. Mm, I've grown, I've lived on my own edibles in Malaysia for the entire month without going to the market. So that's, yeah, I just love that. Yeah. All right, on. Um, there was a question, what was, oh, okay. Actually, Dr. Fig got to that. Um, clarifications on the full name of CDA and SJDK. 
Um, you guys have all your shorthand for your big varieties. Yeah. So it's probably much easier for you, but hard for those that don't know as much. Um, okay. Um, all right. On. All right. Well, should we wrap it up here? I feel like uh, it's been a great discussion. Thank you for for joining us on the whole meeting, and especially with this Q and A. It's always special to kind of get to know you more and um, get to hear uh, more details. Yeah. So, um, John, do you have any final Thank words? Thank you for having us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sama sama, John. <laughs> he can really remember it's so wonderful fantastic <laughs> it's difficult i was in indonesia too but uh, yeah. point. um we had some updates thank you very very much you're uh, welcome for the wonderful presentation um i see in some of the um question and answers you are connected with harvey and mm. thinkaholics so everybody knows harvey yes but our team of uh, Let's Find Out um, videographers went up there and uh, did a fig tasting uh, through his uh, 300 different varieties that he's got. And it was absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes, Harvey. Harvey is popular. Uh, trust me. Yeah, I, I'm sure I could get Kevin um, and the rest of the team to come across to your place and do a Let's Find I'll Out. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. only two. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, a, a wonderful presentation. And thank, thank you, you. Uh, Dr. Fig, uh, for yes. your input too. It's uh, really uh, great behind the scenes work. And probably thanks to all the kids, because I'm sure they do most of the oh, real yeah. work. <laughs> they're like the rich kids, you know, they're doing all the, the propagation, you know. While yes, they are. You know, right, you know, here in California, a lot of us have got uh, very small backyards, so a lot of things are grown in pots. So, mm. you know, seeing what you've done in pots with your figs, uh, even though they're plastic bags, um, is really encouraging for people that don't have a lot of space um, right. You know, I've got fig trees that have got 10 different varieties on them um, because I don't have the space. Mm. So, yeah, I, yeah, that's why I asked the question about grafting and how many uh, is normal or acceptable and doesn't over tax the tree. But I guess it really, the tree itself doesn't know how many uh, different varieties it's got on it. It's just the rootstock, basically. Yes, correct. But anyway, we have uh, some other uh, things that we've got to um, get across to uh, uh, the general membership. Um, we had no abstainers from the two motions that we put forward. Uh, the first motion was carried by uh, 20 votes and the second motion was carried by 16 for those that voted. But nobody said no, so both motions have been carried and... Um, Thank you very much for your participation and that's out of the road and we move forward from here. But uh, again, thank you all very, very much. Um, I appreciate uh, everybody's involvement. The questions and answers were fantastic. And um, you know, I think a lot of people are envious of what you can do in pots um, you know, with, with figs in, in a difficult climate. You know, I wouldn't have thought figs would have grown in Singapore. But uh, yeah, you've proven us all wrong. So there you go. Yeah, nothing is impossible, John. Nothing well, is impossible. You know, but do you do, do you grow durian? Oh yes, I, I have like three du durian trees, but it's taking ages. Taking oh, yeah, ages. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's about ten years. Ten years before it fruits, so I have another four more years ago. Yeah, it's easy enough for you guys to just go down the market and buy them. So yeah. <laughs> But I've got this really cool, John, if you can look at the cool pandan coconut tree. Oh, yeah. It's called pan. Oh, I love this. They are as tall as me, but uh -huh. the way they fruit is in abundance. And the taste of it is just like pandan. You know, that fragrant leaf yeah, is yeah, absolutely yeah. beautiful. So if you do have some time, do research on it. It's called the pandan coconut tree. It's very short, really very short. So I, I really... Small black ones that uh, grow like uh, grapes. No, uh, it grows like grape, but it's green. It's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, they're green. Mm, yeah. It's really good. So we have that. 
So I'm giving you some ideas, okay? Go and research all the weird, <laughs> rare, rare ones. Yeah, well, palm trees and uh, that grow pretty well here uh, in California. So. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, then, guys. Well, thank you again. Um, appreciate everything. And uh, thank you, uh, Ty, for setting it up. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'll uh, be connecting with you and uh, probably talking about different places in Singapore because... I want to get back to Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, and the Philippines next year sometime if I can, um, because I can get over there for work. I've got uh, lots of lots of friends in that part of the world. So um, we have one person with one real quick question. Uh, Nicholas, did you want to type that or just ask it via audio? Um, I'll let you unmute right now. So feel free to unmute if you want to do that. Thank you, Ty. Hey, um, appreciate everyone. Uh -huh. And Mika, you were an excellent speaker on your figs. I have a quick question. I know you, I know you were talking about um, taking out the, the plant from the bag that you, uh, you plant it in mm -hmm. and, um, you know, kind of getting the roots to have a little bit more space. Yep. You spent a little bit of time talking about how you would uh, deal with that. Would you uh, like shake out some of the soil, mm -hmm. and put it in another bag with some more soil, or yeah, okay. Kind of the 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 idea is not to stress up the plant so much. We've done a lot of uh, the the first few failures we did was to really rip up all the soil, dunk it into a pail of water and just getting all the soil out, literally getting all the soil out, leaving just the roots. We discover very quickly that stresses up the plant so much. The, the leaves just wither and slowly just die off. Don't, don't surprise, the, don't give them so much shock. So my advice is uh, you either pot it up. That means just shake off a little bit of the, the soil at the side and at the bottom. Don't, sh don't, disintegrate the soil that's surrounding the root ball and you know in the in that the in the next pot of polybag live, fill it up with the soil uh your media basically about one fourth of the bag first all right not even half just one fourth place it inside and loosely put all the soil around it and slowly pack it up that actually works so the the, the moral of the story is don't shock it too much as much as possible, we know we had to use chopsticks and everything just to loosen it up a little bit. Maintaining about 60% of the soil still remains actually. Um, and then we kind of pot it up into a bigger bag. That, that's my suggestion. And the top layer, uh, the top layer of soil, um, just about that. So remember, don't do the, don't be so gung-ho. Uh, you're not karate kid and just dunk into a pail of water and shake it off. You, you will cry. I, I've cried many times seeing my plants uh, dying off. I, I hope that if, helps. I wonder if because of the heat uh, that you guys have more often than what we might get here in different seasons, if it's, uh, it's, in a cooler season, something like uh, bare rooting the tree to pot it up. I'm Not that that's necessary, but mm -hmm. if that would be uh, less stressful to the tree in it, a cooler it's possible. time of year. Right. And I, I believe it is, it's one of the, the main reasons why, because of the heat. Because I think, just, just remember, it's a, it's a living thing. It's not only is it being shaken up and shocked, it has to still uh, battle with the, the, the sun and the, the heat, basically. And you might be, you might be right on the end of point, honestly. But even after all this reporting, we actually put it in, in the shade. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them didn't survive. So I think the, the best way mm -hmm. moving forward for us then was we decided then not to shake it up so much and shock it up so much and just loose, loosely move the soil a little bit and, and take out as much as we could, but maintaining that, that root ball intact without disturbing the soil. Um, do you use mycorrhiza? Um, it looks like Dr. Fig answered and said they use, have you used uh, great white mycorrhiza? So, uh, uh, yes, we do. Definitely we do. It's godsend, honestly. It's really good. It, it's done wonders for us, actually. And how about rooting hormones? When you have cuttings, uh, to use rooting hormones to, to dip and stick? Uh, I personally don't use rooting hormones, okay. uh, mainly because, um, you know, sometimes rooting hormones work against you uh, mm. and actually accelerate the, the rotting process. Mm. So you've got to be very careful in a sense. So I, I go the natural way. Uh, yes, I treat it and clean it a little bit. Um, but the, the, the 
key trick to that is drying off the stick in in the in room in in the room rather than in the sun, um, and then just plonk it into the soil, and that's about it. I don't use rooting hormones at all. But the the key important part is you have to make sure that the the cutting is a healthy cutting. Right. That's all to it. And you had mentioned yesterday um, not putting things in too large of a container uh, when they're younger, whether it's a cutting or a smaller tree. For That's especially correct. Especially in your conditions where you have a lot more moisture, uh, can root, rot correct. it out. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Right. So um, according to the cutting of the plant, the size of the pot has to be equivalent to that. Don't put a small little baby in a big, big pot or so because uh, there's a the challenge. There's a there's a big you know fault in overwatering. Uh, you don't want that risk at all. So right. the smaller the pot, the smaller the cutting of sapling, put it accordingly to that size. So at least you know the water doesn't retain so much in that pot. Same goes for any plants actually, to be honest. So we always pot one size up. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All very right. good questions. Very good questions. Okay. Well, I think uh, we'll call it. <laughs> I'm sure we could keep getting more. If there's more questions, please shout them out. But if not, we'll wrap this up. Okay. There's been lots of gratitude in the chat window for you Thank and Dr. You. Pig from everyone. So um, I, from on behalf of the whole chapter, thank you for your time and enjoy your lunch while we enjoy our dinner or sleep. <laughs> I will. Thank you very, very much, everybody. It's, it's been a delight. Uh, it's an honor, honestly, uh, to be amongst all of you today. Um, it's going to be one of my most memorable times in my life, honestly. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, Mika. All right, Ty. Okay. Good night to everybody. We'll Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Uh, wash regularly and do all the things you're supposed to do. Yeah, stay Take safe. Okay. Enjoy your figs. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you again. Yes, thank you.